This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times The Headless Cat of Number Blank Lower Seedley Road by Elliot O'Donnell It was related to me by Mr. Robert Dane, who was at one time a tenant of Number Blank, Lower Seedley Road, Seedley. I quote it as nearly as possible in his words, thus... When we, my wife and I, took numbers blank, Lower Seedley Road, no possibility of the place being haunted crossed our minds. Indeed, ghosts were the very last things we reckoned on, as neither of us had the slightest belief in them. Like the generality of solicitors, I am stodgy and unimaginative, whilst my wife is the most practical and matter-of-fact little woman you would meet in a day's march. Nor was there anything about the house that in, it, in any way suggested the superphysical. It was airy and light, no dark corners nor sinister staircases, and equipped throughout with all modern conveniences. We began our lease in June, the hottest June I remember, and nothing occurred to disturb us till October. It happened then in this wise. I will quote from my diary. Monday, October 11th. Dick, that is my brother-in-law, and I, at 11 p.m., were sitting, smoking, and chatting together in the study. All the rest of the household had gone to bed. We had no light in the room, as Dick had a headache, save the fire and that burned so low that its feeble glimmering scarcely enabled us to see each other's face. After a space of sudden and thoughtful silence, Dick took the stump of a cigar from his lips and threw it in the grate, where, for a few minutes, it lay glowing in the gloom. "'Jack,' he said, "'you will think me mad, but there is something deuced queer about this room tonight. Something in the atmosphere I cannot define, but which I have never felt here, or indeed anywhere, before. Look at that cigar end. Look! I did so, and received a shock. What I saw was certainly not the stump Dick had had in his mouth, but an eye, a large, red, and lurid eye, that looked up at us with an expression of the utmost hate. Dick raised the shovel, and struck at it, but without effect. It still glared at us. A great horror then seized us, and unable to remove our gaze from the hellish thing, we sat glued to our chairs, staring at it. This state of affairs lasted till the clock in the hall outside struck twelve, when the eyes suddenly vanished, and we both felt as if something intensely evil influence had been suddenly removed. Dick did not like the idea of sleeping alone, and asked if he might keep the electric light on in his room all night. Tremendous extravagance, but under the circumstances, excusable. I confess devoutly, wished it was morning. Tuesday, October 12th. I was awakened at 11.30 p.m., by Delia, saying to me, "'Oh, Edward, there have been such dreadful noises on the landing, just as if a cat were being worried to death by dogs. Hark! There it is again!' And as she spoke, from apparently just outside the door, came a series of loud screeches, accompanied by savage growls and snarls. Not knowing what to make of it, as we had no animals of our own in the house, but concluding that a door or a window having been left open, a dog and cat had got in from outside, I lit a candle and opened the bedroom door. Instantly the sound ceased, and there was dead silence, and although I searched everywhere, not a vestige of any animal was to be seen. Moreover, all the doors leading into the garden were shut and locked, and the windows closed. 
Not wishing to frighten Delia, I laughingly assured her the cat, a black tom, was all right, that it was sitting on the roof of the summer house, looking none the worse for its treatment, and that I had sent the dog, a terrier, flying out the gate with a well-deserved kick. I explained it was my fault about the front door being left open. My brain had been a bit overstrained through excessive work, and asked her on no account to blame the servants. I grow alarmed at times when I realize how easy lawyering makes lying. Friday, October 21st. On my way to bed last night, I encountered a rush of icy cold air at the first bend of the staircase. The candle flared up, a bright blue flame, and went out. Something, an animal of sorts, came tearing down the stairs past me, and on peering over the banisters I saw, looking up from me from the well of darkness beneath, two big red eyes the counterparts of the one Dick and I had seen in October 11. I threw a matchbox at them, but without effect. It was only when I switched on the electric light that they had disappeared. I searched the house most carefully, but there were no signs of any animal. Joined Delia, feeling nervous and henpecky. Monday, November 7th. Tom and Mabel came running into Delia's room in a great state of excitement after tea today. Mother, they cried, Mother, do come. Some horrid dog has got a cat in the spare room and is tearing it to pieces. Delia, who was mending my socks at the time, flung them everywhere and, springing to her feet, flew to the spare room. The door was shut but proceeding from within was the most appalling pandemonium of screeches and snarls just as if some dog had got hold of a cat by the neck and was shaking it to death delia swung open the door and rushed in the room was empty not a trace of a cat or dog anywhere and the sound ceased on my return home delia met me in the garden jack she said. I have probed the mystery at last. The house is haunted. We must leave. Saturday, November 12th. Sublet House to James Barstow, retired oil merchant, today. He comes in on the 30th. Hope you'll like it. Tuesday, November 15th. Cook left today. I've no fault to find with you, Mum she condescendingly explained to Delia. It's not you, nor the children, nor the food. It's the noises at night, screeches outside my door, which sound like a cat, but which I know can't be a cat, as there is no cat in the house. This morning, Mum, shortly after the clock struck two, things came to a climax. Hearing something in the corner, and wondering if it was a mouse, I ain't a bit afraid of mice, Mum. I sat up in bed and was getting ready to strike a light. The matchbox was in my hand, when something heavy sprang right on top of me and gave a loud growl in my ear. That finished me, Mum. I fainted. When I came to myself, I, I was too frightened to stir, but lay with my head under the blankets till it was time to get up. I think the searched everywhere, but there was no sign of any dog, and as the door was locked, there was no possibility of any dog having got in during the night. Mum, I wouldn't go through what I suffered again for fifty pounds. I've got palpitations even now, and I would rather go without my month's wages than sleep in that room another night. Delia paid her up to date, and she went directly after tea. Friday, November 18th. As I was coming out of the bathroom at 11 p.m., something fell into the bath with a loud splash. I turned to see what it was. There was nothing there. I ran up the stairs to bed, three steps at a time. Sunday, November 20th. Went to church in the morning, and heard the usual Oxford drawl. 
On the way back I was pondering over the sermon and wishing I could contort the law as successfully as Parsons contort the scriptures when Dot, she is six today, came running up to me with a very scared expression in her eyes. Father, she cried, plucking me by the sleeve, do hurry up. Mother is very ill. Full of dreadful anticipations, I tore home, and on arriving found Delia lying on the sofa in a violent fit of hysterics. It was fully an hour before she recovered sufficiently to tell me what had happened. Her account runs thus. After you went to church, she began, I made the custard pudding, jelly, and blancmange for dinner, heard the children their collects, and had just sat down with the intention of writing a letter to mother when I heard a very pathetic mew coming, so I thought, from under the sofa. Thinking it was some stray cat that had gotten in through one of the windows, I tried to entice it out by calling, Puss, Puss, and making the usual silly noise people do on such occasions. No cat coming out, and the mewing still continuing, I knelt down and peered under the sofa. There was no cat there. Had it been night, I should have been very much afraid, but I could scarcely reconcile myself to the idea of ghosts with the room filled with sunshine. Resuming my seat, I went on with my writing, but not for long. The mewing grew nearer. I distinctly heard something crawl out from under the sofa. There was then a, a, a pause, during which you could have heard the proverbial pinfall, and then something sprang upon me and dug its claws in my knees. I looked down, and to my horror and distress perceived, standing on its hind legs, pawing at my clothes, a large tabby cat without a head the neck terminating in a mangled stump. The sight so appalled me that I, I, I don't know what happened, but Nurse and the children came in and found me lying on the floor in hysterics. Can't we leave the house at once? Wednesday, November 30th. Left, number blank, Lower Seedley Road, at 2 p.m. Had an awful scurry to get things packed in time, and dread opening certain of the packing cases, lest we shall find all the crockery smashed. Just as we were starting, Delia cried out that she had left her reticule behind, and I was dispatched in search of it. I searched everywhere, till I was worn out, for I know what Delia is, and was leaving the premises in full anticipation of being sent back again when there was a loud commotion in the hall, just as if a dog had suddenly pounced upon a cat, and the next moment a large tabby, with a head hewn away as Delia had described, rushed up to me and tried to spring on to my shoulders. At this juncture one of the servants cautiously opened the hall door from without and informed me that I was wanted. The cat instantly vanished, and, on my reaching the carriage in a state of breathless haste and trepidation, Delia told me she had found her reticule. She had been sitting on it all the time. In a subsequent note in his diary, a year or so later, Mr. Dane says, after innumerable inquiries read the history of Number Blank, Lower Seedley Road, prior to our inhabiting it, I have at length elicited the fact that twelve years ago a Mr. and Mrs. Barlow lived there. They had one son, Arthur, whom they spoilt in the most outrageous fashion, even to the extent of it encouraging him in acts of cruelty. To afford him amusement, they used to buy rats for his dog, a fox terrier, to worry and on one occasion procured a stray cat, which the servants afterwards declared was mangled in the most shocking manner, before being finally destroyed by Arthur. Here, then, in my opinion, is a very feasible explanation for the hauntings. The phenomenon seen was the phantasm of the poor, tortured cat. 
For if human tragedies are reenacted by ghosts, why not animal tragedies too? It is absurd to suppose man has the monopoly of soul or spirit. End of The Headless Cat of Number Blank Lower Seedley Road This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Strange Disappearance of Mr. Jeremiah Dance by Elliot O'Donnell Twenty pounds a year for a twelve-roomed house with large front lawn, good stabling, and big kitchen gardens. That sounds all right, I commented, but why so cheap? Well, the advertiser, Mr. Baldwin by name, a short, stout gentleman with keen, glittering eyes, replied, Well, you see, it's a bit of a distance from the town, and, er, most people prefer being nearer, like neighbors and all that sort of thing. "'Like neighbors?' I exclaimed. "'I don't. I've just seen about enough of them. "'Drains all right?' "'Oh, yes. Perfect. "'Water? Excellent. "'Everything in good condition? First rate. "'Loneliness the only thing that people object to? "'That is so. "'Then I'll oblige you to send someone to show me over the house, "'for I think it is just the sort of place we want. You see, after being bottled up in a theater all the afternoon and evening, one likes to get away somewhere where it is quiet, somewhere where one can lie in bed in the morning, inhaling pure air and undisturbed by street traffic. I understand, Mr. Baldwin responded. But, er, it is rather late now. Wouldn't you prefer to see it over in the morning? Everything looks at its worst. It's very worst, in the twilight. Oh, I'll make allowances for the dusk, I said. You haven't got any ghosts stowed away there, have you? And he went off into a roar of laughter. <laughs> no, the house is not haunted, Mr. Baldwin replied. Not that it would much matter to you if it were, for I can see you don't believe in spooks. Believe in spooks? I cried. Not much. I would as soon believe in patent hair restorers. Let me see it over at once. Very well, sir. I'll take you there myself, Mr. Baldwin replied, somewhat reluctantly. Here, Tim, fetch the keys of the crow's nest and tell Higgins to bring the trap round. The boy he addressed flew, and in a few minutes the sound of wheels and the jingling of harness announced the vehicle was at the door. Ten minutes later, and I and my escort were bowling merrily over the ground in the direction of the crow's nest. It was early autumn, and the cool evening air, fragrant with the mellowness of the luscious Virginian pippin, was tinged also with the sadness inseparable from the demise of a long and glorious summer. Evidences of decay and death were everywhere, in the brown fallen leaves of the oaks and elms, in the bare and denuded ditches. Here a giant mill-wheel, half immersed in a dark still pool, stood idle and silent. There a hovel, but recently inhabited by hop-pickers, was now tenantless, its glassless windows boarded over, and a wealth of death and rotting vegetable matter in thick profusion over the tiny path and the single stone doorstep. "'Is it always as quiet and deserted as this?' I asked of my companion, who continually cracked his whip as if he liked to hear the reverberations of its echoes. "'Always,' was the reply, "'and sometimes more so. You ain't used to the country.' Not very. I want to try it by way of a change. Are you well versed in the cry of birds? What was that? We were fast approaching an exceedingly gloomy bit of the road, where there were plantations on each side, and the trees united their fantastically forked branches overhead. 
I thought I had never seen so dismal looking a spot, and a sudden lowering of the temperature made me draw my overcoat tighter round me. That? Oh, a night bird of some sort, Mr. Baldwin replied. An ugly sound, wasn't it? Beastly things. I can't imagine why they were created. Whoa! Steady there, steady. The horse reared as he spoke, and taking a violent plunge forward, set off at a wild gallop. A moment later, and I uttered an exclamation of astonishment. Keeping pace with us, although apparently not moving at more than an ordinary walking pace, was a man of medium height, dressed in a Panama hat and Albert coat. He had a thin aquiline nose, a rather pronounced chin, was clean-shaven, and had a startlingly white complexion. By the side of him trotted two poodles, whose close-cropped skins showed out with remarkable perspicuity. "'Who the deuce is he?' I asked, raising my voice to a shout, on account of the loud clatter made by the horse's hoofs and the wheels. "'Who? What?' Mr. Baldwin shouted in return. "'Why, the man walking along with us.' "'Man? I can't see no man,' Mr. Baldwin growled. I looked at him curiously. It may, of course, have been due to the terrific speed we were going, to the difficulty of holding in the horse, but his cheeks were ashy pale and his teeth chattered. "'Do you mean to say,' I cried, "'that you can see no figure walking on my side of the horse and actually keeping pace with it?' "'Of course I can't,' Mr. Baldwin snapped. "'It's an hallucination, caused by the moonlight through the branches overhead. I've experienced it more than once.' "'Then why don't you have it now?' I queried. "'Don't ask so many questions, please,' Mr. Baldwin shouted. "'Don't you see it is as much as I can do to hold the brute in? Heaven preserve us. We were nearly over that time.' The trap rose high in the air as he spoke and then dropped with such a jolt that I was nearly thrown off, and only saved myself by the skin of my teeth. A few yards more the spinney ceased, and we were away out in the open country, plunging and galloping as if our very souls depended on it. From all sides, queer and fantastic shadows of objects, which certainly had no material counterparts in the moon, kissed sward of the rich, ripe meadows, rose to greet us, and filled the lane with their black-and-white wavering, ethereal forms. The evening was one of wonders, for which I had no name, wonders associated with an iciness that was far from agreeable. I was not at all sure which I liked best, the black, stygian, tree-lined part of the road we had just left, or the wide ocean of brilliant moonbeams and streaked suggestions. The figures of the man and the dogs were equally vivid in each. Though I could no longer doubt they were nothing mortal, they were altogether unlike what I had imagined ghosts. Like the generality of people who are psychic, and who have never had an experience of the superphysical, my conception of a phantasm was a thing in white that made ridiculous groanings and still more ridiculous clankings of chains. But here was something different, something that looked, save perhaps for the excessive pallor of its cheeks, just like an ordinary man. I knew it was not a man, partly on account of its extraordinary performance. No man, even if running at full speed, could keep up with us like that, partly on account of the unusual nature of the atmosphere, which was altogether indefinable, it brought with it, and also because of my own sensations. My intense horror, which could not, I felt certain, have been generated by anything physical. I cogitated all this in my mind as I gazed at the figure, and in order to make sure it was no hallucination, I shut first one eye and then the other, covering them alternately with the palm of my hand. The figure, however, was still there, still pacing along at our side with the regular swing, swing of the born walker. We kept on in this fashion till we arrived at a rusty iron gate leading, by means of a weed-covered path, to a low, two-story white house. Here the figures left us, and, as it seemed to me, 
vanished at the foot of the garden wall. This is the house, Mr. Baldwin panted, pulling up with the greatest difficulty, the horse evincing obvious antipathy to the iron gate. And these are the keys. I'm afraid you must go in alone, as I dare not leave the animal even for a minute. Oh, all right, I said. I don't mind. Now that the ghost, or whatever you like to call it, has gone, I'm myself again. I jumped down, and, threading my way through the bramble-entangled path, reached the front door. On opening it, I hesitated. The big, old-fashioned hall, with the great, frowning staircase leading to the gallery overhead, the many open doors, showing naught but bare, deserted boards within, the grim passages, all moonlit and peopled only with queer, flickering shadows, suggested much that was terrifying. I fancied I heard noises, noises like stealthy footsteps moving from room to room and tiptoeing along the passages and down the staircase. Once my heart almost stopped beating as I saw what, at first, I took to be a white face peering at me from a far recess, but which I eventually discovered was only a daub of whitewash, and, once again, my hair all but rose on end when one of the doors at which I was looking swung open and something came forth. Oh, the horror of that moment! As long as I live, I shall never forget it. The something was a cat, just a rather lean but otherwise material black tom, yet in the state my nerves were then it created almost as much horror as if it had been a ghost of course it was the figure of the walking man that was the cause of all this nervousness had it not appeared to me i should doubtless have entered the house with the utmost sang freud my mind set on nothing but the condition of the walls drains etc as it was i held back and it was only after a severe mental struggle I summoned up the courage to leave the doorway and explore. Cautiously, very cautiously, with my heart in my mouth, I moved from room to room, halting every now and then in dreadful suspense as the wind, sowing through across the open land behind the house, blew down the chimneys and set the window frames jarring. At the commencement of one of the passages, I was immeasurably startled to see a dark shape poke forward and then spring hurriedly back, and was so frightened that I dared not advance to see what it was. Moment after moment sped by, and I still stood there, the cold sweat oozing out all over me, and my eyes fixed in hideous expectation on the blank wall. What was it? What was hiding there? Would it spring out on me if I went to sea? At last, urged on by a fascination I found impossible to resist, I crept down the passage, my heart throbbing painfully, and my whole being overcome with the most sickly anticipations. As I drew nearer to the spot, it was as much as I could do to breathe, and my respiration came in quick jerks and gasps. Six. Five four, two feet, and I was at the dreaded angle. Another step, taken after the most prodigious battle, and nothing sprang out on me. I was confronted only with a large piece of paper that had come loose from the wall, and flapped backwards and forwards each time the breeze from without rustled past it. The reaction, after such an agony of suspense, was so great that I leaned against the wall and laughed till I cried. A noise, from somewhere away in the basement, calling me to myself, I went downstairs and investigated. Again a shock, this time more sudden, more acute. Pressed against the window pane of one of the front reception rooms was the face of a man, with corpse-like cheeks and pale, malevolent eyes. I was petrified. Every drop of my blood was congealed. My tongue glued to my mouth. My arms hung helpless. I stood in the doorway and stared at it. This went on for what seemed to me an eternity. Then came a revelation. The face was not that of a ghost, but of Mr. Baldwin, who, getting alarmed at my long absence, had come to look for me. We left the premises together. 
All the way back to the town, I thought, should I, or should I not, take the house? Seen as I had seen it, it was a ghoulish-looking place, as weird as Paris catacomb, but then daylight makes all the difference. Viewed in the sunshine, it would be just like any other house, plain bricks and mortar. I liked the situation. It was just far enough away from town to enable me to escape all the smoke and traffic, and near enough to make shopping easy. The only obstacles were the shadows, the strange, enigmatical shadows I had seen in the hall and passages, and the figure of the walker. Dare I take a house that knew such visitors? At first I said no, and then yes. Something, I could not tell what, urged me to say yes. I felt that a very grave issue was at stake, that of a great wrong connected in some manner with a mysterious figure awaited writing, and that the hand of fate pointed at me as the one and only person who could do it. "'Are you sure the house isn't haunted?' I demanded, as we slowly rolled away from the iron gate, and I leaned back in my seat to light my pipe. "'Haunted?' Mr. Baldwin scoffed. "'Why, I thought you didn't believe in ghosts. Laughed at them.' "'No more I do believe in them,' I retorted. "'But I have children, and we know how imaginative children are. "'I can't undertake to stop their imaginations.' No, but you can tell me whether anyone else has imagined anything there. Imagination is sometimes very infectious. As far as I know, then, no. Leastways, I have not heard tell of it. Who is the last tenant? Mr. Jeremiah Dance. Why did he leave? How do I know? Got tired of being there, I suppose. How long was he there? Nearly three years. Where is he now? That's more than I can say. Why do you wish to know? Why, I repeated, because it is more satisfactory to me to hear about the house from someone who has lived in it. Has he left no address? Not that I know of, and it's more than two years since he was here. What? The house has been empty all that time? Two years is not very long. Houses, even townhouses, are frequently unoccupied for longer than that. I think you like it. I did not speak again till the drive was over, and we drew up outside the landlord's house. I then said, Let me have an agreement. I've made up my mind to take it. Three years and the option to stay on. That was just like me. Whatever I did, I did on the spur of the moment, a mode of procedure that often led me into difficulties. A month later, and my wife, children, servants, and I were all ensconced in the crow's nest. That was the beginning of October. Well, the month passed by, and November was fairly in before anything remarkable happened. It then came about in this fashion. Jenny, my eldest child, a self-willed and rather bad-tempered girl of about twelve, evading the vigilance of her mother, who had forbidden her to go out as she had a cold, ran to the gate one evening to see if I was anywhere in sight. Though barely five o'clock, the moon was high in the sky, and the shadows of the big trees had already commenced their gambols along the roadside. Jenny clambered up the gate, as children do, and peering over, suddenly espied what she took to be me, striding towards the house at a swinging pace, and followed by two poodles. "'Papa!' she cried. "'How cute of you! Only to think of you bringing home two doggies! Oh, Papa! Naughty Papa! What will Mum say?' And climbing over into the lane at imminent danger to life and limb, she tore frantically towards the figure. To her dismay, however, it was not me, but a stranger with a horribly white face and big glassy eyes, which he turned down on her and stared. She was so frightened that she fainted, and some ten minutes later I found her lying out there on the road. From the description she gave me of the man and dogs, I felt quite certain 
they were the figures I had seen, though I pretended the man was a tramp, and assured her she would never see him again. A week passed, and I was beginning to hope nothing would happen, when one of the servants gave notice to leave. At first she would not say why she did not like the house, but when pressed, made the following statement. It's haunted, Mrs. B. I can put up with mice and beetles, but not with ghosts. I've had a queer sensation, as if water was following down my spine ever since I've been here, but never saw anything till last night. I was then in the kitchen getting ready to go to bed. Jane and Emma had already gone up, and I was preparing to follow them, when, all of a sudden, I heard footsteps, quick and heavy, cross the gravel and approach the window. The boss, says I to myself, maybe he's forgot the key and can't get in at the front door. Well, I went to the window and was about to throw it open when I got an awful shock. Pressed against the glass, looking in at me, was a face. Not the boss's face, not the face of anyone living, but a horrid white thing with a drooping mouth and wide-open glassy eyes that had no more expression in them than a pig. As sure as I'm standing here, Mrs. B., it was the face of a corpse, the face of a man that had died no natural death, and by its side, standing on their hind legs and staring in at me, too, were two dogs, both poodles, also no living things, but dead, horribly dead. Well, they stared at me, all three of them, for perhaps a minute, certainly not less, and then vanished. That's why I'm leaving, Mrs. B. My heart was never overstrong. I always suffered with palpitations, and if I saw those heads again, it would kill me. After this, my wife spoke to me seriously. Jack, she said, are you sure there's nothing in it? I don't think Mary would leave us without a good cause, and the description of what she saw tallies exactly with the figure that frightened Jenny. <coughs> Jenny assures me she never said a word about it to the servants. They can't both have imagined it. I did not know what to say. My conscience pricked me. Without a doubt, I ought to have told my wife of my own experience in the lane and have consulted her before taking the house. Supposing she, or any of the children, should die of fright, it would be my fault. I should never forgive myself. You've something on your mind. What is it? my wife demanded. I hesitated a moment or two, and then told her. The next quarter of an hour was one I do not care to recollect, but when it was over, and she had had her say, it was decided I should make inquiries and see if there was any possible way of getting rid of the ghosts. With this end in view, I drove to the town, and after several fruitless efforts, was at length introduced to a Mr. Marsden, clerk of one of the banks, who, in reply to my questions, said, Well, Mr. B., it's just this way. I do know something, only, in a small place like this, one has to be so extra careful what one says. Some years ago, a Mr. Jeremiah Dance occupied the crow's nest, he came here apparently a total stranger, and though often in the town, was only seen in the company of one person, his landlord, Mr. Baldwin, with whom, if local gossip is to be relied on, he appeared to be on terms of the greatest familiarity. Indeed, they were seldom apart, walked about the lanes arm in arm, visited each other's houses on alternate evenings, called each other Teddy, and Leslie. This state of things continued for nearly three years, and then people suddenly began to comment on the fact that Mr. Dance had gone, or at least was no longer visible. An errand boy, returning back to town late one evening, swore to being passed on the way by a trap containing Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Dance, who were speaking in very loud voices, just as if they were having a violent altercation. On reaching that part of the road where the trees are thickest overhead, the lad overtook them, or rather Mr. Baldwin, preparing to mount into the trap. Mr. Dance was nowhere to be seen. And from that day, 
to this, nothing has ever been heard of him. As none of his friends or relations came forward to raise inquiries, and all his bills were paid, several of them by Mr. Baldwin, no one took the matter up. Mr. Baldwin pooh-poohed the errand boy's story, and declared that, on the night in question, he had been alone in an altogether different part of the county, and knew nothing whatever of Mr. Dance's movements, further than that he had recently announced his intention of leaving the crow's nest, before the expiration of the three years' lease. He had not the remotest idea where he was. He claimed the furniture in payment of the rent due to him. Did the matter end there? I asked. In one sense of the word, yes. In another, no. Within a few weeks of Dance's disappearance, rumors got afloat that his ghost had been seen on the road, just where, you may say, you saw it. As a matter of fact, I've seen it myself, and so have crowds of other people. Has anyone ever spoken to it? Yes, and it has vanished at once. I went there one night with the purpose of laying it, but on its appearance suddenly, I confess, I was so startled that I had not only forgot what I rehearsed to say, but ran home without uttering as much as a word. And what are your deductions of the case? The same as everyone else's, Mr. Marston whispered. Only, like everyone else, I dare not say. Had Mr. Dance any dogs? Yes, two poodles, of which, much to Mr. Baldwin's annoyance, everyone noticed this. He used to make the most ridiculous fuss. Humph, I observed. That settles it. Ghosts. And to think I never believed in them before. Well, I am going to try. Try what? Mr. Marston said, a note of alarm in his voice. Try laying it. I have an idea I may succeed. I wish you luck, then. May I come with you? Thanks. No, I rejoined. I would rather go there alone. I said this in a well-lighted room, with the hum of a crowded thoroughfare in my ears. Twenty minutes later, when I had left all that behind, and was fast approaching the darkest part of an exceptionally dark road, I wished I had not. At the very spot where I had previously seen the figures, I saw them now. They suddenly appeared by my side, and though I was going at a great rate, for the horse took fright, they kept easy pace with me. Twice I essayed to speak to them, but could not ejaculate a syllable through sheer horror, and it was only by nerving myself to the utmost and forcing my eyes away from them that I was able to stick to my seat and hold on to the reins. On and on we dashed, until trees, road, sky, universe, were obliterated in one blinding whirlwind that got up my nostrils, choked my ears, and deadened me to everything, save the all-terrorizing instinctive knowledge that the figures by my side were still there, stalking along as quietly and leisurely as if the horse had been going at a snail's pace. At last, to my intense relief, for never had the ride seemed longer, I reached the crow's nest, and as I hurriedly dismounted from the trap, the figure shot past me and vanished. Once inside the house, and in the bosom of my family, where all was light and laughter, courage returned, and I upbraided myself bitterly for this cowardice. I confessed to my wife, and she insisted on accompanying me the following afternoon at twilight to the spot where the ghost appeared to originate. To our intense dismay, we had not been there more than three or four minutes before Dora, our youngest girl, a pretty, sweet-tempered child of eight, came running up to us with a telegram which one of the servants had asked her to give us. My wife, snatching it from her, and reading it, was about to scold her severely when she suddenly paused and, clutching hold of the child with one hand, pointed hysterically at something on one side of her with the other. I looked, and Dora looked, and we both saw, standing erect and staring at us, the spare figure of a man 
with a ghastly white face and dull, lifeless eyes. Clad in a Panama hat, Albert coat, and small patent leather boots. Beside him were two glossy, abnormally glossy, poodles. I tried to speak, but, as before, was too frightened to articulate a sound, and my wife was in the same plight. With Dora, however, it was otherwise, and she electrified us by going up to the figure and exclaiming, Who are you? You must be very ill to look so white. Tell me your name. The figure made no reply, but gliding slowly forward, moved up to a large isolated oak, and pointing with the index finger of its left hand at the trunk of the tree, seemingly sank into the earth and vanished from view. For some seconds everyone was silent, and then my wife exclaimed, Jack, I shouldn't wonder if Dora hasn't been the means of solving the mystery. Examine the tree closely. I did so. The tree was hollow, and inside it were three skeletons. End of the Strange Disappearance of Mr. Jeremiah Dance This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times the Phantom Dachshund of W Street, London, West. In letter number one, my correspondent writes, Though I am by no means overindulgent to dogs, the latter generally greet me very effusively, and it would seem that there is something in my individuality that is peculiarly attractive to them. This being so, I was not greatly surprised one day, when in the immediate neighborhood of X Street, to find myself persistently followed by a rough-haired dachshund wearing a gaudy yellow collar. I tried to scare it away by shaking my sunshade at it, but all to no purpose. It came resolutely on, and I was beginning to despair of getting rid of it, when I came to X Street, where my husband once practiced as an oculist. There it suddenly altered its tactics, and, instead of keeping at my heels, became my conductor, forging slowly ahead with a gliding motion that both puzzled and fascinated me. I furthermore observed that, notwithstanding the temperature, it was not a whit less than ninety degrees in the shade, the legs and stomach of the dachshund were covered with mud and dripping with water. When it came to number ninety, it halted, and veering swiftly around, eyed me in the strangest manner, just as if it had some secret it was bursting to disclose. It remained in this attitude until I was within two or three feet of it, certainly not more, when, to my unlimited amazement, it absolutely vanished, melted away into thin air. The iron gate leading to the area was closed, so that there was nowhere for it to have hidden. And, besides, I was almost bending over it at the time, as I wanted to read the name on its collar. There being no one near at hand, I could not obtain a second opinion, and so came away wondering whether what I had seen was actually a phantasm or a mere hallucination. Number 90, I might add, judging by the brass plate on the door, was inhabited by a doctor, with an unpronounceable foreign name, etc., etc. I think one cannot help attaching a great deal of importance to what this lady says, as her language is strictly moderate throughout, and because she does not seem to have been biased by any special views on the subject of animal futurity. Correspondent number 2, who, by the way, is a total stranger to the writer whose letter I have just quoted, is candidly devoted to dogs, regarding them as in every way on par with, if not actually superior to, most human beings. Still, notwithstanding this partiality and consequent profusion of terms of endearment, 
which will doubtless prove somewhat nauseating to many, her letter is, in my opinion, valuable, because it not only refers to the phenomenon I have mentioned, but to a certain extent furnishes a reason for its occurrence. The lady writes as follows. I once had a rough-haired dachshund, Robert, whom I loved devotedly. We were living at the time near H Street, which always had a particular attraction for dear Robert, who, I am now obliged to confess, had rather too much liberty, more, indeed, than eventually proved good for him. The servants complained that Robert ruled the house, and I believe what they said was true, for my sister and I idolized him, giving him the very best of everything, and never having the heart to refuse him anything he wanted. You will probably scarcely credit it, but I have sat up all night nursing him when he had a cold and was otherwise indisposed. Can you therefore imagine my feelings when my darling was absent one day from dinner? Such a thing had never happened before, for, fond of morning constitutionals as poor Robert was, he was always the soul of punctuality at mealtimes. Neither my sister nor I would hear of eating anything. Whilst he was missing, not a morsel did we touch, but slipping on our hats, and bidding the servants to do the same, we scoured the neighborhood instead. The afternoon passed without any sign of Robert, and when bedtime came, he always slept in our room, and still no signs of our pet. I thought we should both have gone mad. Of course, we advertised, selecting the most popular and, accordingly, the most likely papers, and we resorted to other mediums, too. Our darling little Robert was irrevocably, irredeemably lost. For days we were utterly inconsolable, doing nothing but mope morning, noon, and night. I cannot tell you how forlorn we felt, nor how long we should have remained in that state, but for an instant which, although revealing the terrible manner of his death, gave us every reason to feel sure we were not parted from him for all time, but would meet again in the great hereafter. It happened in this wise. I was walking along W Street one evening when, to my intense joy and surprise, I suddenly saw my darling standing on the pavement a few feet ahead of me, regarding me intently from out of his pathetic brown eyes. A sensation of extreme coldness now stole over me, and I noticed, with something akin to shock, that, in spite of the hot, dry weather, Robert looked as if he had been in the rain for hours. He wore the bright yellow collar I had bought him shortly before his disappearance, so that had there been any doubt as to his identity, that would have removed it instantly. On my calling to him, he turned quickly round, and, with a slight gesture of the head, as if bidding me to follow, he glided forward. My natural impulse was to run after him, pick him up, and smother him with kisses. But try as hard as I could, I could not diminish the distance between us, although he never appeared to alter his pace. I was quite out of breath by the time we reached H Street, where, to my surprise, he stopped at number 90, and, turning round again, gazed at me in the most beseeching manner. I can't describe that look. Suffice it to say that no human eyes could have been more expressive. But of what beyond the most profound love and sorrow I cannot, I dare not, attempt to state. I have pondered upon it through the whole of a midsummer night, but not even the severest of my mental efforts have enabled me to solve it to my satisfaction. Could I but do that, I feel I should have fathomed the greatest of all mysteries, the mystery of life and death. I do not know for how long we stood there looking at one another. It may have been minutes, or hours, or, again, but a few paltry seconds. He took the initiative from me, for, as I leaped forward to raise him in my arms, he glided through the stone steps into the area. Convinced now that what I beheld was Robert's apparition, I determined to see this strange affair through to the bitter end, and, entering the gate, I also went down into the area. The phantom had come to an abrupt halt by the side of a low wooden box, and as I foolishly made an abortive attempt to reach it with my hand, 
It vanished instantaneously. I searched the area thoroughly, and was assured that there was no outlet save by the steps I had just descended, and no hole, nor nook, nor cranny where anything the size of Robert could be completely hidden from sight. What did it all mean? Ah, I knew Robert had always had a weakness for exploring areas, especially in H Street, and in the box where his wraith disappeared I espied a piece of raw meat. Now, there are ways in which a piece of raw meat may lie without arousing suspicion, but the position of this morsel strangely suggested that it had been placed there carefully, and for assuredly no other purpose than to entice stray animals. Resolving to interrogate the owner of the house on the subject, I rapped at the front door, but was informed by the manservant, obviously a German, that his master never saw anyone without an appointment. I then did a very unwise thing. I explained the purpose of my visit to this man, who not only denied any knowledge of my dog, but declared the meat must have been thrown into the area by some passer-by. "'No one in this house throw away good meat like that,' he explained. "'We eat all we can get here. We have nothing for the animals. Please go away at once, or the master will be very angry. He stand no nonsense from anyone. And, as I had no alternative, for, after all, who would regard a ghost in the light of evidence, I had to obey. I found out, however, from a medical friend that number 90 was tenanted by Mr. K., an Anglo-German who was deemed a very clever fellow at a certain London hospital, where he was often occupied in vivisection. I dare say, my friend went on to remark, K. does a little vivisecting in his private surgery by way of practice, and, well, you see, these foreign chaps are not so squeamish in some respects as we are. But can't he be stopped? I asked. It is horrible, monstrous, that he should be allowed to murder our pets. You don't know for certain that he has was the reply. You only suppose so from what you say you saw, and evidence of that immaterial nature is no evidence at all. No, you can do nothing except to be extra careful in future, and if you have another dog, make him steer clear of number 90 H Street. I was sensible enough to see that he was right, and the matter dropped. I soon noticed one thing, however, namely that there were no more pieces of meat temptingly displayed in the box, so it is just possible K. got wind of my inquiries and thought it policy to desist from his nefarious practices. Poor Robert, to think of him suffering such a cruel and ignominious death, and my being powerless to avenge it. Surely, if vivisection is really necessary, and the welfare of mankind cannot be advanced by any less barbarous system, why not operate on creatures less deserving of our love and pity than dogs, on creatures which, whilst being nearer allied to man in physiology and anatomy, are at the same time far below the level of brute creation in character and disposition? For example, why not experiment on wife-beaters and cowardly street ruffians, and, one might reasonably add, on all those pseudo-humanitarians who, by their constant petitions to Parliament for the abolition of the lash, encourage every form of blackguardism and bestiality. This concludes the letter of correspondent number two, and with the sentiment in the closing paragraphs, I must say, I heartily agree. Only I should like to add a few more people to the list. One other case of haunting of this type is taken from my same work. One old Halloween, wrote a Mrs. Sebwim, I was staying with some friends in Hampstead, and we amused ourselves by working spells to commemorate the night. There is one spell in which one walks alone down a path sowing hemp seed and repeating some fantastic words when one is supposed to see those that are destined to come into one's life in the near future. Eager to put the spell to the test, 
I went into the garden by myself, and, walking boldly along a path, bordered on each side by evergreens, sprinkled hemp seed lavishly. Nothing happening, I was about to desist, when suddenly I heard a pattering on the gravel, and, turning round, I beheld an ugly little black and tan mongrel running towards me, wagging its stumpy tail. Not at all prepossessed with the creature, for my own dogs are purebred, and thinking it must have strayed into the grounds, I was about to drive it out, and had put down my hand to prevent it jumping on my dress, when, to my astonishment, it had vanished. It literally melted away into fine air beneath my very eyes. Not knowing what to make of the incident, but feeling inclined to attribute it to a trick of the imagination, I rejoined my friends. I did not tell them what had happened, although I made a memorandum of it in one of my innumerable notebooks. Within six months of this incident, I was greatly astonished to find a dog corresponding with the one I have just described running about on the lawn of my house in Bath. How the animal got there was a complete mystery, and what is stranger still, it seemed to recognize me, for it rushed towards me, frantically wagging its diminutive tail. I had not the heart to turn it away, and, as it seemed quite homeless, and so the forlorn little mongrel was permitted to make its home in my house. And a very happy home it proved to be. For three years all went well, and then the end came swiftly and unexpectedly. I was in Blackheath at the time, and the mongrel was in Bath. It was all Halloween, but there was no hemp seed sowing, for no one in the house but myself took the slightest interest in anything appertaining to the superphysical or mystic. Eleven o'clock came, and I retired to rest, my bed being one of those antique four-posters, hung with curtains that shine crimson in the ruddy glow of a cheerful fire. All my preparations complete, I had pulled back the hangings, and was about to slip in between the sheets, when, to my unbounded amazement, what should I see sitting on the counterpane but the black and tan mongrel? It was he right enough. There could not be another such ugly dog, though, unlike his usual self, he evinced no demonstrations of joy. On the contrary, he appeared downright miserable. His ears hung, his mouth dropped, and his bleared little eyes were watery and sad. Greatly perplexed, if not alarmed, at so extraordinary a phenomenon, I nevertheless felt constrained to put out my hand to comfort him. When, as I had half anticipated, he immediately vanished. Two days later I received a letter from Bath, and in a postscript I read that the mongrel, we never called it by any other name, had been run over and killed by a motor, the accident occurring on all Halloween, about eleven o'clock. Of course, my sister wrote, you won't mind very much. It was so extremely ugly. And, well, we were only too glad it was none of the other dogs. But my sister was wrong, for notwithstanding its unsightly appearance and hopeless lack of breed, I had grown to like that little black and tan more than any of my rare and choice pets. End of The Phantom Dachshund of W Street, London West by Elliot O'Donnell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Dunlop The Top Attic in Pringle's Mansion, Edinburgh By Elliot O'Donnell A charming lady, Miss South informs me that no house interested her more as a child than Pringle's Mansion, Edinburgh. Pringle's Mansion, by the by, is not the real name of the house, nor is the original building still standing. The fact is, my friend has been obliged to disguise the locality for fear of an action for slander of title, such as happened in the Egham case of 1904-7. to Miss South never saw, save in a picture, the house that so fascinated her, 
but through repeatedly hearing about it from her old nurse, she felt that she knew it by heart, and used to amuse herself hour after hour in the nursery, drawing diagrams of the rooms and passages, which, to make quite realistic, she named and numbered. There was the Admiral's room, Madame's room, Miss Ophelia's room, Master Gregory's room, Letty's, the nurse's room, the cook's room, the butler's room, the housemaid's room, and the haunted room. The house was very old, probably the 16th century, and was concealed from the thoroughfare by a high wall that enclosed it on all sides. It had no garden, only a large yard covered with faded yellow paving stones, and containing a well with an old-fashioned roller and bucket. When the well was cleaned out, an event which took place periodically on a certain date, every utensil in the house was called into requisition for ladling out the water, and the Admiral, himself supervising, made every servant in the establishment take an active part in the proceedings. On one of these occasions, the Admiral announced his intention of going down the well in the bucket. That was a rare moment in Letty's life, for when the Admiral had been let down in the bucket, the rope broke. Indeed, the thought of what the Laird would say when he came up almost resulted in his not coming up at all. However, someone, rather bolder than the rest, retained sufficient presence of mind to effect a rescue, and the timid ones, thankful enough to survive the explosion, had to be content on half rations till further notice. But in spite of its association with such a martinet, and in spite of her ghostly experiences in it, Letty loved the house and was never tired of singing its praises. It was a two-storied mansion with roomy cellars but no basement. There were four reception rooms, all oak panelled on the ground floor, numerous kitchen offices including a cosy housekeeper's room, and a capacious entrance hall in the centre of which stood a broad oak staircase. The cellars, three in number, and chiefly used as lumber rooms, were deep down and dank and horrid. On the first floor, eight bedrooms opened onto a gallery overlooking the hall, and the top story, where the servants slept, consisted solely of attics connected with one another by a dark, narrow passage. It was one of these attics that was haunted, although as a matter of fact the ghost had been seen in all parts of the house. When Letty entered the Admiral's service she was but a bairn, and had never even heard of ghosts, nor did the other servants surprise her of her hauntings, having received strict injunctions not to do so from the Laird. But Letty's home, humble though it was, had been very bright and cheerful, and the dark precincts of the mansion filled her with dismay. Without exactly knowing why she was afraid, she shrank in terror from descending into the cellars and felt anything but pleased at the prospect of sleeping alone in an attic. Still, nothing occurred to really alarm her until about a month after her arrival. It was early in the evening, soon after twilight, and she'd gone down into one of the cellars to look for a bootjack, which the Admiral swore by all that was holy must be found before supper. Placing the light she had brought with her on a packing case, she was groping about amongst the boxes when she perceived, to her astonishment, that the flame of the candle had suddenly turned blue. She then felt icy cold and was much startled on hearing a loud clatter as of some metal instrument on the stone floor in the far-off corner of the cellar. Glancing in the direction of the noise, she saw, looking at her, two eyes two obliquely set, lurid, light eyes, full of the utmost devilry. Sick with terror and utterly unable to account for that which she beheld, she stood stock still, her limbs refusing to move, her throat parched, her tongue tied. The clanging was repeated and a shadowy form began slowly to crawl towards her. She dared not afterwards surmise what would have happened to her had not the Laird himself come down at this moment. At the sound of his stentorian voice, the phantasm vanished. But the shock had been too much for Letty. She fainted, 
and the Admiral, carrying her upstairs as carefully as if she'd been his own daughter, gave peremptory orders that she should never be allowed to go down into the cellar alone again. But now that Letty herself had witnessed a manifestation, the other servants no longer felt bound to secrecy and soon poured into her ears endless accounts of the hauntings. Everyone, they informed her, except Master Gregory and Perkins, the butler, had seen one or other of the ghosts, and the cellar apparition was quite familiar to them all. They also declared that there were other parts of the house quite as badly haunted as the cellar, and it might have been partly owing to these gruesome stories that poor Letty always felt scared when crossing the passages leading to the attics. As she was hastening down one of them early one morning, she heard someone running after her. Thinking it was one of the other servants, she turned round, pleased to think that, that someone else was up so early too, and saw to her horror a dreadful looking object that seemed to be partly human and partly animal. The body was quite small and its face bloated and covered with yellow spots. It had an enormous animal mouth, the lips of which, moving furiously without emitting any sound, showed that the creature was endeavouring to speak, but could not. The moment Letty screamed for help, the phantasm vanished. But her worst experience was yet to come. The spare attic, which she was told was so badly haunted that no one would sleep in it, was the room next to hers. It was a room Letty could well believe was haunted, for she'd never seen another equally gloomy. The ceiling was low and sloping, the window tiny, and the walls exhibited all sorts of odd nooks and crannies. A bed, antique and worm-eaten, stood in one recess, a black oak chest in another, and at right angles with the door in another recess stood a wardrobe that used to creak and groan alarmingly every time Letty walked along the passage. Once she heard a chuckle, a low diabolical chuckle, which she fancied came from the chest. And once, when the door of the room was open, she caught the glitter of a pair of eyes, the same pale malevolent eyes that so frightened her in the cellar. From her earliest childhood, Letty had been periodically given to somnambulism, and one night, just about a year after she went into service, she got out of bed and walked in her sleep into the haunted room. She awoke to find herself standing, cold and shivering, in the middle of the floor, and it was some seconds before she realised where she was. Her horror, when she did discover where she was, is not easily described. The room was bathed in moonlight, and the beams, falling with noticeable brilliancy on each piece of furniture the room contained, at once riveted Letty's attention, and so fascinated her that she found herself utterly unable to move. A terrible and most unusual silence predominated everywhere, and although Letty's senses were wonderfully and painfully on the alert, she could not catch the slightest sound from any of the rooms on the landing. The night was absolutely still. No breath of wind, no rustle of leaves, no flapping of ivy against the window. Yet the door suddenly swung back on its hinges and slammed furiously. Letty felt that this was the work of some supernatural agency, and fully expecting that the noise had awakened the cook, who was a light sleeper, or pretended she was, listened in a fever of excitement to hear her get out of bed and call out. The slightest noise and the spell that held her prisoner would, Letty felt sure, be broken. But the same unbroken silence prevailed. A sudden rustling made Letty glance fearfully at the bed, and she perceived to her terror the valance swaying violently to and fro. Sick with fear, she was now constrained to stare in abject helplessness. Presently there was a slight, very slight movement on the mattress. The white dust cover rose, and under it, Letty saw the outlines of what she took to be a human figure gradually take shape. Hoping, praying that she was mistaken, and that what appeared to be on the bed was but a trick of her imagination, she continued staring in an agony of anticipation. But the figure remained, extended at full length like a corpse. The moment slowly passed 
A church clock boomed too, and the body moved. Letty's jaw fell, her eyes almost bulged from her head, whilst her fingers closed convulsively on the folds of her nightdress. The unmistakable sound of breathing now issued from the region of the bed, and the dust cover commenced slowly to slip aside. Inch by inch it moved, until first of all Letty saw a few wisps of dark hair, then a few more, then a thick cluster, then something white and shining, a protruding forehead. Then dark, very dark brows. Then two eyelids, yellow, swollen and fortunately tightly closed. Then a purple conglomeration of Letty knew not what, of anything but what was human. The sight was so monstrous it appalled her, and she was overcome with a species of awe and repulsion for which the language of mortality has no sufficiently energetic expression. She momentarily forgot that what she looked on was merely superphysical, but regarded it as something alive, something that ought to have been a child, comely and healthy as herself, and she hated it. It was an outrage on maternity, a blot on nature, a filthy discredit to the house, a blight, a sore, a gangrene. It turned over in its sleep, the cover was hurled aside, and a grotesque object, round, pulpy, webbed, and of leprous whiteness, an object which Letty could hardly associate with a hand, came grovelling out. Letty's stomach heaved. The thing was beastly, indecent, vile, it ought not to live. And the idea of killing flashed through her mind, boiling over with indignation and absurdly forgetful of her surroundings. She turned round and groped for a stone to smash it. The moonlight on her naked toes brought her to her senses. The thing in the bed was a devil. Though brought up a member of the free church with an abhorrence of anything that could in any way be contorted into papist practices, Letty crossed herself. As she did so, a noise in the passage outside augmented her terror. She strained her ears painfully, and the sound developed into a footstep, soft, light, and surreptitious. It came gently towards the door. It paused outside, and Letty intuitively felt that it was listening. Her suspense was now so intolerable that it was almost with a feeling of relief that she beheld the door slowly, very slowly, begin to open. A little wider, a little wider, and yet a little wider, but still nothing came. Ah, Letty's heart turned to ice. Another inch, and a shadowy something slipped through and began to wriggle itself stealthily over the floor. Letty tried to divert her gaze, but could not. An irresistible magnetic attraction keeping her eyes glued to the gradually approaching horror. When within a few feet of her, it halted, and again, Letty felt it was listening, listening to the breathing on the bed, which was heavy and bestial. Then it twisted round and Letty watched it crawl into the wardrobe. After this there was a long and anxious wait. Then Letty saw the wardrobe door slyly open, and the eyes of the cellar, inexpressibly baleful and glittering like burnished steel in the strong phosphorescent glow of the moon, peep out not at her, but through her, at the object lying on the bed. They were not only eyes this time, but a form, vague, misty and irregular, but still with sufficient shape to enable Letty to identify it as that of a woman, tall and thin, and with a total absence of hair, which was emphasised in the most lurid and ghastly fashion. With a snake-like movement, the evil thing slithered out of the wardrobe, and gliding past Letty approached the bed. Letty was obliged to follow every proceeding. She saw the thing deftly snatch the bolster from under the sleeping head, noted the gleam of hellish satisfaction in its eyes as it pressed the bolster down, and watched the murdered creature's contortions grow fainter and fainter, until they finally ceased. The eyes then left the room, and from afar off, away below in the abysmal cellars of the house, came the sound of digging. Faint. Very faint, but unquestionably digging. 
This terminated the grim phantasmal drama for that night at least, and Letty, chilled to the bone but thoroughly alert, escaped to her room. She spent her few remaining hours of rest wide awake, determining never to go to bed again without fastening one of her arms to the iron staples. With regard to the history of the house, Letty never learned anything more remarkable than that long ago an idiot child was supposed to have been murdered in the haunted attic, by whom tradition did not say. The Admiral and his family left Pringle's mansion the year Letty became Miss South's nurse, and as no one would stay in the house, presumably on account of the hauntings, it was pulled down, and an inexcusably inartistic edifice was erected in its place. End of the top attic in Pringle's Mansion, Edinburgh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Glamis Castle by Elliot O'Donnell. Of all the hauntings in Scotland, none has gained such widespread notoriety as the hauntings of Glamis Castle, the seat of the Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn in Forfarshire. Part of the castle, that part which is the more frequently haunted, is of ancient though uncertain date, and if there is any truth in the tradition that Duncan was murdered there by Macbeth, must at any rate have been in existence at the commencement of the eleventh century. Of course, extra buildings have from time to time been added, and renovations made, but the original structure remains pretty nearly the same as it always has been, and is included in a square tower that occupies a central position and commands a complete view of the entire castle. Within this tower, the walls of which are fifteen feet thick, there is a room hidden in some unsuspected quarter that contains a secret, the keynote to one at least of the hauntings, which is known only to the Earl, his heir, on the attainment of his twenty-first birthday, and the factor of the estate. In all probability, the mystery attached to this room would challenge but little attention were it not for the fact that unearthly noises, which at the time were supposed to proceed from this chamber, have been heard by various visitors sleeping in the square tower. The following experience is said to have happened to a lady named Bond. I append it more or less in her own words. It is a good many years since I stayed at Glamis. I was, in fact, but little more than a child, and had only just gone through my first season in town. But, though young, I was neither nervous nor imaginative. I was inclined to be what is termed stolid, that is to say, extremely matter-of-fact and practical. Indeed, when my friends exclaimed, You don't mean to say you're going to stay at Glamis? Don't you know it's haunted? I burst out laughing. Haunted? I said. How ridiculous! There are no such things as ghosts. One might as well believe in fairies. Of course, I did not go to Glamis alone. My mother and sister were with me, but whereas they slept in the more modern part of the castle, I was at my own request apportioned a room in the square tower. I cannot say that my choice had anything to do with the secret chamber. That and the alleged mystery had been dinned into my ears so often that I had grown thoroughly sick of the whole thing. No, I wanted to sleep in the square tower for quite a different reason, a reason of my own. I kept an aviary. The tower was old, and I naturally hoped its walls would be covered with ivy and teeming with birds' nests, some of which I might be able to reach, and I am ashamed to say, plunder from my window. Alas for my expectations! Although the square tower was so ancient that in some places it was actually crumbling away, not the sign of a leaf, not the vestige of a bird's nest could I see anywhere. The walls were abominably, brutally bare. However, it was not long before my disappointment gave way to delight, for the air that blew in through the open window was so sweet, so 
richly scented with heather and honeysuckle, and the view of the broad, sweeping, thickly wooded grounds so indescribably charming that, despite my inartistic and unpoetical nature, I was entranced, entranced as I had never been before, and never have been since. Ghosts, I said to myself. Ghosts, how absurd, how preposterously absurd! Such an adorable spot as this can only harbour sunshine and flowers. I well remember, too, for, as I have already said, I was not poetical, how much I enjoyed my first dinner at Glamis. The long journey and keen mountain air had made me hungry, and I thought I had never tasted such delicious food, such ideal salmon from the Esk, and such heavenly fruit. But I must tell you that, although I ate heartily, as a healthy girl should, by the time I went to bed I had thoroughly digested my meal, and was in fact quite ready to partake of a few oatmeal biscuits I found in my dressing-case, and remembered having bought at Perth. It was about eleven o'clock when my maid left me, and I sat for some minutes wrapped in my dressing-gown before the open window. The night was very still, and save for an occasional rustle of the wind in the distant tree-tops, the hooting of an owl, the melancholy cry of a peewit, and the hoarse barking of a dog, the silence was undisturbed. The interior of my room was, in nearly every particular, modern. The furniture was not old. There were no grim carvings, no grotesquely fashioned tapestries on the walls, no dark cupboards, no gloomy corners. All was cosy and cheerful, and when I got into bed no thought of bogle or mystery entered my mind. In a few minutes I was asleep, and for some time there was nothing but a blank, a blank in which all identity was annihilated. Then suddenly I found myself in an oddly shaped room with a lofty ceiling, and a window situated at so great a distance from the black oaken floor as to be altogether inaccessible from within. Feeble gleams of phosphorescent light made their way through the narrow panes, and served to render distinct the more prominent objects around. But my eyes struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the wall, one of which inspired me with terror such as I had never felt before. The walls were covered with heavy draperies that were sufficient in themselves to preclude the possibility of any save the loudest of sounds penetrating without. The furniture if such one could call it, puzzled me. It seemed more fitted for the cell of a prison or lunatic asylum, or even for a kennel, than for an ordinary dwelling-room. I could see no chair, only a coarse deal table, a straw mattress, and a kind of trough. An air of irredeemable gloom and horror hung over and pervaded everything. As I stood there, I felt I was waiting for something, something that was concealed in the corner of the room I dreaded. I tried to reason with myself, to reassure myself that there was nothing there that could hurt me, nothing that could even terrify me. But my efforts were in vain, my fears grew. Had I some definite knowledge as to the cause of my alarm, I should not have suffered so much. But it was my ignorance of what was there, of what I feared, that made my terror so poignant. Each second saw the agony of my suspense increase. I dared not move, I hardly dare breathe, and I dreaded lest the violent pulsation of my heart should attract the attention of the unknown presence and precipitate its coming out. Yet, despite the perturbation of my mind, I caught myself analysing my feelings. It was not danger I abhorred so much as its absolute effect, fright. I shuddered at the bare thought of what result the most trivial incident, the creaking of a board, ticking of a beetle, or hooting of an owl, might have on the intolerable agitation of my soul. In this unnerved and pitiable condition I felt that the period was bound to come, sooner or later, when I should have to abandon life and reason together in the most desperate of struggles with fear. At length something moved. An icy chill ran through my frame, and the horror of my anticipations immediately reached its culminating point. The presence was about to reveal itself. The gentle rubbing of a soft body on the floor. The crack of a bony joint, breathing, 
another crack, and then, was it my own excited imagination, or the disturbing influence of the atmosphere, or the uncertain twilight of the chamber that produced before me, in the Stygian darkness of the recess, the vacillating and indistinct outline of something luminous and horrid, I would gladly have risked futurity to have looked elsewhere. I could not. My eyes were fixed. I was compelled to gaze steadily in front of me. Slowly, very slowly, the thing, whatever it was, took shape. Legs, crooked, misshapen human legs. A body, tawny and hunched. Arms, long and spidery, with crooked, knotted fingers. A head, large and bestial, and covered with a tangled mass of grey hair that hung around its protruding forehead and pointed ears in ghastly mockery of curls. A face, and herein was the realization of all my direst expectations, a face white and staring, pig-like in formation, malevolent in expression, a hellish combination of all things foul and animal, and yet, withal, not without a touch of pathos. As I stared at it aghast, it reared itself on its haunches after the manner of an ape, and leered piteously at me. Then shuffling forward it rolled over and lay sprawled out like some ungainly turtle, and wallowed as for warmth in the cold grey beams of early dawn. At this juncture the handle of the chamber door turned. Someone entered, there was a loud cry, and I awoke awoke to find the whole tower, walls and rafters, ringing with the most appalling screams I have ever heard, screams of something or of someone, for there was in them a strong element of what was human as well as animal, in the greatest distress. Wondering what it meant, and more than ever terrified, I sat up in bed and listened, listened whilst the conviction, the result of intuition, suggestion, or what you will, but a conviction all the same, forced me to associate the sounds with the thing in my dream, and I associate them still. It was, I think, in the same year, in the year that the foregoing account was narrated to me, that I heard another story of the hauntings at Claymiss, a story in connection with a lady whom I will call Miss McGuinney. I append her experience as nearly as possible as she is stated to have told it. I seldom talk about my adventure, Miss McGuinney announced, because so many people ridicule the superphysical, and laugh at the mere mention of ghosts. I own I did the same myself till I stayed at Glamis, but a week there quite cured me of scepticism, and I came away a confirmed believer. The incident occurred nearly twenty years ago, shortly after my return from India, where my father was then stationed. It was years since I had been to Scotland, indeed, I had only once crossed the border, and that when I was a babe. Consequently, I was delighted to receive an invitation to spend a few weeks in the land of my birth. I went to Edinburgh first, I was born in Drumshew Gardens, and thence to Glamis. It was late in the autumn. The weather was intensely cold, and I arrived at the castle in a blizzard. Indeed, I do not recollect ever having been out in such a frightful storm. It was as much as the horses could do to make headway, and when we reached the castle we found a crowd of anxious faces eagerly awaiting us in the hall. Chilled! I was chilled to the bone, and thought I should never thaw, but the huge fires and bright and cosy atmosphere of the rooms, for the interior of Glamis was modernized throughout, soon set me right, and by tea-time I felt nicely warm and comfortable. My bedroom was in the oldest part of the castle, the square tower, but although I had been warned by some of the guests that it might be haunted, I can assure you that when I went to bed no subject was farther from my thoughts than the subject of ghosts. I returned to my room at about half-past eleven. The storm was then at its height, all was babel and confusion, impenetrable darkness mingled with the wildest roaring and shrieking, and when I peeped through my casement window I could see nothing. The panes were shrouded in snow snow which was incessantly dashed against them with cyclonic fury. I fixed a comb in the window frame so as not to be kept awake by the constant jarring, and with the caution characteristic of my sex, looked into the wardrobe and under the bed for burglars, though heaven knows what I should have done had I found one there, placed a candlestick and matchbox on the table by my bedside, 
lest the roof or window should be blown in during the night or any other catastrophe happen, and after all these precautions got into bed. At this period of my life I was a sound sleeper, and being somewhat unusually tired after my journey I was soon in a dreamless slumber. What awoke me I cannot say, but I came to myself with a violent start, such as might have been occasioned by a loud noise. Indeed that was at first my impression, and I strained my ears to try and ascertain the cause of it. All was, however, silent. The storm had abated, and the castle and grounds were wrapped in an almost preternatural hush. The sky had cleared, and the room was partially illuminated by a broad stream of silvery light that filtered softly in through the white and tightly drawn blinds. A feeling that there was something unnatural in the air, that the stillness was but the prelude to some strange and startling event, gradually came over me. I strove to reason with myself, to argue that the feeling was wholly due to the novelty of my surroundings, but my efforts were fruitless, and soon there stole upon me a sensation to which I had been hitherto an utter stranger. I became afraid. An irrepressible tremor pervaded my frame. My teeth chattered. My blood froze. Obeying an impulse, an impulse I could not resist, I lifted myself up from the pillows, and peering fearfully into the shadowy glow that lay directly in front of me, listened. Why I listened I do not know, saving that an instinctive spirit prompted me. At first I could hear nothing, and then, from a direction I could not define, there came a noise, low, distinct, uninterpretative. It was repeated in rapid succession, and speedily construed itself into the sound of mailed footsteps racing up the long flight of stairs at the end of the corridor leading to my room. Dreading to think what it might be, and seized with a wild sentiment of self-preservation, I made frantic endeavours to get out of bed and barricade my door. My limbs, however, refused to move. I was paralysed. Nearer and nearer drew the sounds, and I could at length distinguish, with a clearness that petrified my very soul, the banging and clanging of sword scabbards, and the panting and gasping of men, sore pressed in a wild and desperate race. And then the meaning of it all came to me with hideous abruptness. It was a case of pursued and pursuing. The race was for life. Outside my door the fugitive halted, and from the noise he made in trying to draw his breath, I knew he was dead beat. His antagonist, however, gave him but scant time for recovery. Bounding at him with prodigious leaps, he struck him a blow that sent him reeling with such tremendous force against the door, that the panels, although composed of the stoutest oak, quivered and strained like flimsy matchboard. The blow was repeated. The cry that rose in the victim's throat was converted into an abortive, gurgling groan, and I heard the ponderous battle-axe carve its way through helmet, bone, and brain. A moment later came the sound of slithering armour, and the corpse, slipping sideways, toppled to the ground with a sonorous clang. A silence too awful for words now ensued. Having finished his hideous handiwork, the murderer was quietly deliberating what to do next, whilst my dread of attracting his attention was so great that I scarcely dare breathe. This intolerable state of things had already lasted for what seemed to me a lifetime, when, glancing involuntarily at the floor, I saw a stream of dark-looking fluid lazily lapping its way to me from the direction of the door. Another moment, and it would reach my shoes. In my dismay I shrieked aloud. There was a sudden stir without, a significant clatter of steel, and the next moment, despite the fact that it was locked, the door slowly opened. The limits of my endurance had now happily been reached. The overtaxed valves of my heart could stand no more. I fainted. On my awakening to consciousness it was morning, and the welcome sun rays revealed no evidences of the distressing drama. I own I had a hard tussle before I could make up my mind to spend another night in that room, and my feelings as I shut the door on my retreating maid and prepared to get into bed were not the most enviable. But nothing happened, nor did I again experience anything of the sort till the evening before I left. I had laid down all the afternoon, for I was tired after a long morning's tramp on the moors, 
a thing I dearly love, and I was thinking it was about time to get up, when a dark shadow suddenly fell across my face. I looked up hastily, and there, standing by my bedside and bending over me, was a gigantic figure in bright armour. Its visor was up, and what I saw within the cask is stamped forever on my memory. It was the face of the dead, the long since dead, with the expression, the subtly hellish expression, of the living. As I gazed helplessly at it, it bent lower. I threw up my hands to ward it off. There was a loud rap at the door, and as my maid softly entered to tell me tea was ready, it vanished. The third account of the Glamis hauntings was told me as long ago as the summer of 1893. I was travelling by rail from Perth to Glasgow, and the only other occupant of my compartment was an elderly gentleman who from his general air and appearance might have been a dominie or member of some other learned profession. I can see him in my mind's eye now, a tall, thin man with a premature stoop. He had white hair, which was brushed forward on either side of his head in such a manner as suggested a wig, bushy eyebrows, dark piercing eyes, and a stern though somewhat sad mouth. His features were fine and scholarly, he was clean-shaven. There was something about him, something that marked him from the general horde, something that attracted me, and I began chatting with him soon after we left Perth. In the course of a conversation that was, at all events, interesting to me, I adroitly managed to introduce the subject of ghosts, then, as ever, uppermost in my thoughts. Well, he said, I can tell you of something rather extraordinary that my mother used to say happened to a friend of hers at Glamis. I have no doubt you are well acquainted with the hackneyed stories in connection with the hauntings at the castle. For example, Earl Beardy playing cards with the devil, and the leaping woman without hands or tongue. You can read about them in scores of books and magazines. But what befell my mother's friend, whom I will call Mrs. Gibbons, for I have forgotten her proper name, was apparently of a novel nature. The affair happened shortly before Mrs. Gibbons died, and I always thought that what took place might have been in some way connected with her death. She had driven over to the castle one day, during the absence of the owner, to see her cousin who was in the employ of the Earl and Countess. Never having been at Glamis before, but having heard so much about it, Mrs. Gibbons was not a little curious to see that part of the building called the Square Tower that bore the reputation of being haunted. Tactfully biding an opportunity, she sounded her relative on the subject, and was laughingly informed that she might go anywhere about the place she pleased, saving to one spot, namely Bluebeard's Chamber, and there she could certainly never succeed in poking her nose, as its locality was known to only three people, all of whom were pledged never to reveal it. At the commencement of her tour of inspection, Mrs. Gibbons was disappointed. She was disappointed in the tower. She had expected to see a gaunt, grim place, crumbling to pieces with age, full of blood-curdling spiral staircases and deep, dark dungeons. Whereas everything was the reverse, the walls were in an excellent state of preservation, absolutely intact. The rooms bright and cheerful, and equipped in the most modern style. There were no dungeons, at least none on view, and the passages and staircases were suggestive of nothing more alarming than bats. She was accompanied for some time by her relative, but on the latter being called away, Mrs. Gibbons continued her rambles alone. She had explored the lower premises, and was leisurely examining a handsome furnished apartment on the top floor, when, in crossing from one side of the room to the other, she ran into something. She looked down. Nothing was to be seen. Amazed beyond description, she thrust out her hands, and they alighted on an object which she had little difficulty in identifying. It was an enormous cask or barrel, lying in a horizontal position. She bent down close to where she felt it, but she could see nothing, nothing but the well-polished boards of the floor. To make sure again that the barrel was there, she gave a little kick and drew back her foot with a cry of pain. She was not afraid, the sunshine in the room for bad fear. Only exasperated, she was certain a barrel was there, that it was objective, and she was angry with herself for not seeing it. She wondered if she were going blind, but the fact that other objects in the room were plainly visible to her 
discountenanced such an idea. For some minutes she poked and jabbed at the thing, and then, seized with a sudden and uncontrollable panic, she turned round and fled, and as she tore out of the room, along the passage and down the seemingly interminable flight of stairs, she heard the barrel behind her in close pursuit. Bump! 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 At the foot of the staircase Mrs. Gibbons met her cousin, and as she clutched the latter for support, the barrel shot past her, still continuing its descent. Bump! 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 Though the steps, as far as she could see, had ended, till the sounds gradually dwindled away in the far distance. While the manifestations lasted, neither Mrs. Gibbons nor her cousin spoke, but the latter, as soon as the sounds had ceased, dragged Mrs. Gibbons away, and in a voice shaking with terror cried, "'Quick, quick, don't for heaven's sake look round! Worse has yet to come!' And pulling Mrs. Gibbons along in breathless haste, she unceremoniously hustled her out of the tower. "'That was no barrel!' Mrs. Gibbons's cousin subsequently remarked by way of explanation. "'I saw it. I've seen it before. Don't ask me to describe it. I dare not. I dare not even think of it. Whenever it appears, a certain thing happens shortly afterwards. Don't, don't on any account say a word about it to anyone here.' And Mrs. Gibbons, my mother told me, came away from Glamis a thousand times more curious than she was when she went. The last story I have to relate is one I heard many years ago when I was staying near Balmoral. A gentleman named Vance, with strong antiquarian tastes, was staying at an inn near the Strathmore estate, and roaming abroad one afternoon, in a fit of absent-mindedness, entered the castle grounds. It so happened, fortunately for him, that the family were away, and he encountered no one more formidable than a man he took to be a gardener, an uncouth-looking fellow, with a huge head covered with a mass of red hair, hawk-like features, and high cheekbones, high even for a Scot. Struck with the appearance of the individual, Mr. Vance spoke, and, finding him wonderfully civil, asked whether, by any chance, he ever came across any fossils when digging in the garden. "'I dinna ken the meaning of fossils,' the man replied. "'What are they?' Mr. Vance explained, and a look of cunning gradually pervaded the fellow's features. "'No!' he said. I've never found any of those things, but if you'll give me your word to say nothing about it, I'll show you something I once dug up over yonder by the square tower. Do you mean the haunted tower? The tower that is supposed to contain the secret room? Mr. Vance exclaimed. An extraordinary expression, an expression such as Mr. Vance found it impossible to analyse, came into the man's eyes. Yes, that's it, he nodded. What people call, and rightly call, the haunted tower. I got it from there. "'Don't you say naught about it.' Mr. Vance, whose curiosity was roused, promised, and the man, politely requesting him to follow, led the way to a cottage that stood nearby, in the heart of a gloomy wood. To Mr. Vance's astonishment, the treasure proved to be the skeleton of a hand, a hand with abnormally large knuckles, and the first joint of both fingers and thumb much shorter than the others. It was the most extraordinarily shaped hand Mr. Vance had ever seen and he did not know in the least how to classify it. It repelled, yet interested him, and he eventually offered the man a good sum to allow him to keep it. To his astonishment, the money was refused. "'You may have the thing and welcome,' the fellow said. "'Only, I advise you not to look at it late at night, or just before getting into bed. If you do, you may have bad dreams.' "'I'll take my chance of that,' Mr. Vance laughed. "'You see, being a hard-headed cockney, I'm not superstitious.' It's only you Highlanders and your first cousins the Irish who believe nowadays in bogles and omens and such like. And packing the hand carefully in his knapsack, Mr. Vance bid the strange-looking creature good morning and went on his way. For the rest of the day the hand was uppermost in his thoughts. Nothing had ever fascinated him so much. He sat pondering over it the whole evening, and bedtime found him still examining it, examining it upstairs in his room by candlelight. He had a hazy recollection that some clock had struck twelve, and he was beginning to feel that it was about time to retire, when in the mirror opposite him he caught sight of the door. It was open. "'By Joe, that's odd,' he said to himself. "'I could have sworn I shut and bolted it.' To make sure, he turned round. The door was closed. "'An optical delusion,' he murmured. "'I'll try again.' He looked into the mirror. The door reflected in it was open. 
Utterly at a loss to know how to explain the phenomenon, he leaned forward in his seat to examine the glass more carefully, and as he did so he gave a start. On the threshold of the doorway was a shadow, black and bulbous. A cold shiver ran down Mr. Vance's spine, and just for a moment he felt afraid, terribly afraid. But he quickly composed himself. It was nothing but an illusion. There was no shadow there in reality. He had only to turn round and, and the thing would be gone. It was amusing, entertaining. He would wait and see what happened. The shadow moved. It moved slowly through the air, like some huge spider or odd-shaped bird. He would not acknowledge that there was anything sinister about it, only something droll, excruciatingly droll. Yet it did not make him laugh. When it had drawn a little nearer, he tried to diagnose it, to discover its material counterpart in one of the objects around him, but he was obliged to acknowledge his attempts were failures. There was nothing in the room in the least degree like it. A vague feeling of uneasiness crept over him. Was the thing the shadow of something with which he was familiar but could not just then recall to mind? Something he feared? Something that was sinister? He struggled against the idea. He dismissed it as absurd, but it returned returned and took deeper root as the shadow drew nearer. He wished the house was not quite so silent, that he could hear some indication of life, anything, anything for companionship, and to rid him of the oppressive, the very oppressive sense of loneliness and isolation. Again a thrill of terror ran through him. "'Look here!' he exclaimed aloud, glad to hear the sound of his own voice. "'Look here! If this goes on much longer, I shall begin to think I'm going mad. I've had enough!' and more than enough of magic mirrors for one night, it's high time I got into bed. He strove to rise from his chair, to move. He was unable to do either. Some strange, tyrannical force held him a prisoner. A change now took place in the shadow. The blur dissipated, and the clearly defined outlines of an object, an object that made Mr. Vance perfectly sick with apprehension, slowly disclosed themselves. His suspicions were verified. It was the hand, the hand, no longer skeleton, but covered with green, mouldering flesh, feeling its way, slyly and stealthily towards him, towards the back of his chair. He noted the murderous twitching of its short, flat fingertips, the monstrous muscles of its hideous thumb, and the great clumsy hollows of its clammy palm. It closed in upon him. Its cold, slimy, detestable skin touched his coat, his shoulder, his neck, his head. It pressed him down, squashed, suffocated him. He saw it all in the glass. And then an extraordinary thing happened. Mr. Vance suddenly became animated. He got up and peeped furtively round. Chairs, bed, wardrobe had all disappeared. So had the bedroom. And he found himself in a small, bare, comfortless, queerly constructed apartment without a door and with only a narrow slit of a window, somewhere near the ceiling. He had in one of his hands a knife with a long, keen blade, and his whole mind was bent on murder. Creeping stealthily forward, he approached a corner of the room, where he now saw, for the first time, a mattress, a mattress on which lay a huddled-up form. What the thing was, whether human or animal, Mr. Vance did not know, did not care. All he felt was that it was there for him to kill, that he loathed and hated it, hated it with a hatred such as nothing else could have produced. Tiptoeing gently up to it, he bent down, and lifting his knife high above his head, plunged it into the thing's body with all the force he could command. He recrossed the room, and found himself once more in his apartment at the inn. He looked for the skeleton hand. It was not where he had left it. It had vanished. Then he glanced at the mirror, and on its brightly polished surface saw not his own face, but the face of the gardener, the man who had given him the hand. Features, colour, hair, all, all were identical, wonderfully, hideously identical, and as the eyes met his they smiled devilishly. Early the next day, Mr. Vance set out for the spinney and cottage. They were not to be found. Nobody had ever heard of them. He continued his travels, and some months later, at a lone collection of pictures in a gallery in Edinburgh, he came to an abrupt, a very abrupt halt, before the portrait 
of a gentleman in ancient costume. The face seemed strangely familiar, the huge head with thick red hair, the hawk-like features, the thin and tightly compressed lips. Then in a trice it all came back to him. The face he looked at was that of the uncouth gardener, the man who had given him the hand, and to clinch the matter, the eyes leered. The End of Glamis Castle by Elliot O'Donnell Recording by Peter Yearsley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. How to Become a Werewolf by Elliot O'Donnell. As I have already stated, in some people lycanthropy is hereditary, and when it is not hereditary it may be acquired through the performance of certain of the rites ordained by black magic. For the present I can only deal with the more general features of these rites, which vary according to locality, and the conditions of mind essential to those who would successfully practice these rites. In the first place, it is necessary that the person desirous of acquiring the property of lycanthropy should be in earnest and a believer in those superphysical powers whose favor he is about to ask. Assuming we have such an individual, he must, first of all, betake himself to a spot remote from the haunts of men. The powers to be petitioned are not to be found promiscuously anywhere. They favor only such waste and solitary places as the deserts, woods, and mountain tops. The locality chosen, our candidate must next select a night when the moon is new and strong. He must then choose a perfectly level piece of ground, and on it, at midnight, he must mark either with chalk or string, it really does not matter which, a circle of not less than seven feet in radius, and within this, and from the same center, another circle of three feet in radius. Then in the center of this inner circle he must kindle a fire, and over the fire place an iron tripod containing an iron vessel of water. As soon as the water begins to boil, the would-be lycanthropist must throw into it handfuls of any three of the following substances, asafoetida, parsley, opium, hemlock, henbane, saffron, aloe, poppy seed, and solanum, repeating as he does so these words, Spirits from the deep, who never sleep, be kind to me. Spirits from the grave, without a soul to save, be kind to me. Spirits of the trees that grow upon the leaves, be kind to me. Spirits of the air, foul and black, not fair, be kind to me. Water spirits hateful, to ships and bathers fateful, be kind to me. Spirits of earthbound dead, that glide with noiseless tread, be kind to me. Spirits of heat and fire, destructive in your ire, be kind to me. Spirits of cold and ice, patrons of crime and vice, be kind to me. Wolves, vampires, satyrs, ghosts, elect of all the devilish hosts, I pray you send hither, send hither, send hither, the great gray shape that makes men shiver, 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 come, come, come. The supplicant then takes off his vest and shirt, and smears his body with the fat of some newly killed animal, preferably a cat, mixed with aniseed, camphor, and opium. Then he binds round his loins a girdle made of wolf skin, and kneeling down within the circumference of the first circle, waits for the advent of the unknown. When the fire burns blue and quickly dies out, the unknown is about to manifest itself. If it does not then actually appear, it will make its presence felt. There is little consistency in the various methods of the spirit's advent. Sometimes a deep unnatural silence immediately precedes it, 
sometimes crashes and bangs groanings and shriekings herald its approach when it remains invisible its presence is indicated and accompanied by a sensation of abnormal cold and the most acute terror it is sometimes visible in the guise of a huntsman which is perhaps its most popular shape sometimes in the form of a monstrosity partly man and partly beast and sometimes it is seen ill-defined and only partially materialized to what order of spirits it belongs is of course purely a matter of conjecture i believe it to be some malevolent superphysical creative power such as in my opinion participated largely in the creation of this and other planets i do not believe it to be the devil because i do not believe in the existence of only one devil but in countless devils it is difficult to say to what extent the unknown is believed to be powerful by those who approach it for the purpose of acquiring the gift of lycanthropy but i am inclined to think that the majority of these at all events do not ascribe to it any supreme power but regard it merely as a local spirit the spirit of some particular wilderness or forest of course it is quite possible that the property of werewolfery might be acquired by other than a direct personal communication with the unknown as for example by eating a wolf's brains by drinking water out of a wolf's footprints or by drinking out of a stream from which three or more wolves have been seen to drink but as most of the stories i have heard of werewolfery acquired in this way are of a wild and improbable nature i think there is little to be learned from the modus operandi they advocate the following story which i believe to be true in the main was told to me by a dr brennerviski whom i met in boulogne ten years ago my informant began i was engaged in a geological expedition in montenegro i left setting in company with my escort dugald dugady a dalmatian who had served me on many former occasions but owing to an accident i was compelled to leave him behind at a village about thirty miles east of the capital as it was absolutely necessary for me to have a guide i chose a montenegrin called knetz dalgety warned me against him Kanetz has the evil eye, he said. He will bring misfortune on you. Choose someone else. Kanetz was certainly not particularly prepossessing. He was tall and angular and pockmarked and sandy-haired, and his eyes had a peculiar cast, only a cast, of course, nothing more. To balance these detractions, he was civil in his manners and extremely moderate in his terms. Dalgety, faithful fellow, almost wept as he watched us depart i shall never see you again he said never just outside the last cottage in the village we passed a gigantic broad-shouldered man clad in the usual clothes of frieze a black skull-cap wide trousers and tights from the knee to the ankle over his shoulders was a new white struka of which he seemed very proud whilst he had a perfect armament of weapons rifles pistols yatagan polished up to the knocker and cartouche box he was conversing with a girl at one of the windows but turned as we came up to him and leered impudently at kanatz the sallow in kanatz's cheeks turned to white and the cast in his eyes became ten times more pronounced but he said nothing only drooped his head and shuffled a little closer to me for the rest of the day he spoke little and i could tell from his expression and general air of dejection that he was still brooding over the incident the following morning we stayed the night in a wayside inn knights informed me that the route we had intended taking to skaravoski the town i meant to make the headquarters for my daily excursions was blocked a blood feud had suddenly been declared between two tribes and that consequently we should have to go by some other way i inquired who had told him and whether he was sure the information was correct 
He replied that our host had given him the warning, and that the possibility of such an occurrence had been suggested to him before leaving Setting. But, he added, there is no need to worry, for the other road, though somewhat wild and rough, is in reality quite as safe, and certainly a good league and a half shorter. As it made no very great difference to me which way I went, I acquiesced. There was no reason to suspect Knights of any sinister motive. Cases of treachery on the part of escorts are practically unknown in Montenegro, and if it were true that some of the tribes were engaged in a vendetta, then I certainly agreed that we could not give them too wide a berth. At the same time I could not help observing a strange innovation in Knights's character. Besides the sullenness that had laid hold of him since his encounter with the man and the girl, he now exhibited a restless eagerness. His eyes were never still, his lips constantly moved, and I could frequently hear him muttering to himself as we trudged along. He asked me several times if I believed in the supernatural, and when I laughingly replied, No, I am far too practical and level-headed, he said, Wait, we are now in the land of spirits, you will soon change your opinion. The country we were traversing was certainly forbidding, forbidding enough to be the hunting ground of legions of ferocious animals. But the supernatural? Bah! I flouted such an idea. All day we journeyed along a lofty ridge, from which, shortly before dusk, it became necessary to descend by a narrow and precipitous declivity, full of danger and difficulty. At the bottom we halted three or four hours to wait for the moon, in a position sufficiently romantic and uncomfortable. A northeast wind, cold and biting, came whistling over the hills and seemed to be sucked down into the hollow where we sat on the chilly stones. The moment we sighted the slightly depressed orb of the moon over the vast hill of rocks and the Milky Way spanning the heavens with a brilliancy seen only in the east, we pushed on again. On, along a painfully rough and uneven track, flanked on either side by perpendicular masses of rock that reared themselves, black and frowning, like some huge ruined wall, on, till we eventually came to the end of the defile. Then an extraordinary scene burst upon us. Whilst the irregular line of rocks continued close on our left, beyond it, glittering in the miraculously magnifying moonlight with more gigantic proportions than nature had afforded, was a huge pile of white rocks, looking like the fortifications of some vast, fabulous city. There were yawning gateways flanked by bastions of great altitude, towers and pyramids, crescents and domes, and dizzy pinnacles, and castellated heights, all invested with the unearthly grandeur of the moon, yet showing in their wide breaches and indescribable ruin sure proofs that during a long course of ages they had been battered and undermined by rain, hurricane, and lightning, and all the mighty artillery of time. Piled on one another and repeated over and over again, these strangely contorted rocks stretched as far as the eye could reach, sinking, however, as they receded, and leading the mind, though not the eye, down to the plain below, through which a turbid stream wound its way rebelliously, like some great twisting, twirling, silvery-scaled serpent. It was into this gorge that Knights, in a voice thrilling with excitement, informed me we must plunge. It is called, he explained to me, the Haunted Valley, and it is said to have been from time immemorial under the spell of the grey spirits, a species of phantasm, half man and half animal, that have the power of metamorphosing men into wild beasts. Horses, he went on to inform me, showed a great reluctance to enter the valley, which was a sure proof that the place was in very truth phantom-ridden. I must say its appearance favored that theory. The path by which we descended was almost perpendicular and filled with shadows. 
precipices hemmed us in on every side, and here and there a huge fragment of rock, standing like a petrified giant, its summit gleaming white in the moonbeams, barred our way. On reaching the bottom, we found ourselves exactly opposite the pile of white rocks, at the base of which roared the stream. Knights now declared that our best plan was to halt and bivouac here for the night. I expostulated, saying that I did not feel in the least degree tired, that the spot was far from comfortable, and that I preferred to push on. Knights then pleaded that he was too exhausted to proceed, and in fact whined to such an extent that in the end I gave way, and lying down under cover of a boulder, tried to imagine myself in bed. I did actually fall asleep, and awoke with the sensation of something crawling over my face. Sitting up, I looked around for Knights. He was nowhere to be seen. The oddness of his behavior, his alternate talkativeness and sullenness, and the anxiety he had manifested to come by this route, made me at last suspicious. Had he any ulterior motive in leading me hither? What had become of him? Where was he? I got up and approached the margin of the stream, and then for the first time I felt frightened. The illimitable possibilities of that enormous mass of castellated rocks towering above me both quelled and fascinated me. Were these flickering shadows shadows? Or, or had Knights, after all, spoken the truth when he said this valley was haunted? The moonlight rendered every object I looked upon so startlingly vivid that not even the most trivial detail escaped my notice, and the more I scrutinized, the more firmly the conviction grew on me that I was in a neighborhood differing essentially from any spot I had hitherto visited. I saw nothing with which I had been formerly conversant. The few trees at hand resembled no growth of either the torrid, temperate, or northern frigid zones, and were altogether unlike those of the southern latitudes with which I was most familiar. The very rocks were novel in their mass, their color, and their stratification, and the stream itself, utterly incredible as it may appear, had so little in common with the streams of other countries that I shrank away from it in alarm. I am at a loss to give any distinct idea of the nature of the water. I can only say it was not like ordinary water, either in appearance or behavior. Even in the moonlight it was not colorless, nor was it of any one color, presenting to the eye every variety of green and blue. Although it fell over stones and rocks with the same rapid descent as ordinary water, it made no sound, neither splash nor gurgle. Summoning up courage, I dipped my fingers in the stream. It was quite cold and limpid. The difference did not lie there. I was still puzzling over this phenomenon, still debating in my mind the possibility of the valley being haunted, when I heard a cry a peculiarly ominous cry, human and yet animal. For a few seconds I was too overcome with fear to move. At last, however, having in some measure pulled myself together, I ventured cautiously in the direction of the noise, and after treading as lightly as I could over the rough and rocky soil for some couple of hundred yards, suddenly came to an abrupt standstill. Kneeling beside the stream, with its back turned to me, was an extraordinary figure, a thing with a man's body and an animal's head, a dark, shaggy head with unmistakable prick ears. I gazed at it aghast. What was it? What was it doing? As I stared, it bent down, lapped the water, and raising its head uttered the same harrowing sound that had brought me thither. I then saw, with a fresh start of wonder, that its hands, which shone very white in the moonlight, were undergoing a gradual metamorphosis. I watched carefully, and first one finger and then another became amalgamated in a long furry paw, armed with sharp, formidable talons. 
I suppose that in my fear and astonishment I made some sound of sufficient magnitude to attract attention. Anyhow, the creature at once swung round and, with a snarl of rage, rushed savagely at me. Being unarmed and also, I confess, unnerved, I completely lost my presence of mind, and not attempting to escape, though flight would have been futile, for I was nothing of a runner, shrieked aloud for help. The thing sprang at me, its jaws wide open, its eyes red with rage. I struck at it wildly, and have dim recollections of my puny blows landing on its face. It closed in on me, and gripping me tightly round the body with its sinewy arms, hurled me to the ground. My head came in violent contact with a stone, and I lost consciousness. On recovering my senses, I was immeasurably surprised to find Dalgetty sitting on a rock watching me, whilst close beside him was Knights, blood-stained and motionless. Dalgetty explained the situation. Convinced that evil would befall you in the company of such a man, he said, pointing to the figure at his feet, I determined to set out in pursuit of you. By a miracle which I attribute to Our Lady, the effects of my accident suddenly wore off, and I felt absolutely well. I borrowed a horse, and starting from Setting at nine this morning, reached the inn where you passed last night at eleven. There I learned the route you had taken, and leaving the horse behind, on such a road I was safer on my legs, I pressed on. The ground, being moist in places, revealed your footprints, and I had no difficulty at all in tracing you to the bottom of the declivity. There I was at sea for some moments, since the rocky soil was too hard to receive any impressions. But hearing the howl of some wild animal, I concluded you were attacked, and guided by the sound, I arrived here to find a werewolf actually preparing to devour you. A bullet from my rifle speedily rendered the creature harmless, and a close inspection of it proved that my surmises were only too correct. It was none other than our friend here with the evil eye, Kanites. Kanites a werewolf? I ejaculated. Yes. He invades you here because he had made up his mind to drink the water of the enchanted stream, and so become metamorphosed from a man to a wild beast. His object in doing so was to destroy a young farmer who had stolen his sweetheart, and for whom he, as a man, was no match. However, he is harmless now, but it is a warning to you in future to trust no one who has the evil eye. Belief in the evil eye is everywhere prevalent in the East and it is undoubtedly true that people who have certain peculiarities in their eyes, both with regard to expression, color, and formation, are people to be avoided. If malevolently inclined, they invariably bring ill luck on all who become acquainted with them. I have followed the careers of several people in whom I have noticed this baneful feature, and their histories have been one long tale of sin or sorrow often both. But though the evil eye denotes an evil, superphysical influence, the werewolf is not necessarily possessed of it. Sometimes a werewolf may be told by the long, straight, slanting eyebrows which meet at an angle over the nose. Sometimes by the hands, the third finger of which is a trifle the longest, or by the fingernails which are red, almond-shaped, and curved sometimes by the ears, which are set rather low and far back on their heads, and sometimes by a noticeably long swinging stride, which is strongly suggestive of some animal. Either one or other of these features is always present in hereditary werewolves, and is also frequently developed in those people who become werewolves, either at the same time as, or soon after, they acquire the property. Footnote. Psychic influences are demonstrated by the position of the planets. For instance, at a new moon, cusp of seventh house, 
and co-joined with Saturn in opposition to Jupiter, sinister superphysical presences are much in evidence on the Earth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Spirits of Werewolves by Elliot O'Donnell. It seems that there is a disposition in certain minds to associate lycanthropy with the doctrine of the transmigration of souls. A brief examination of the latter will, however, suffice to show there is very little analogy between the two. Transmigration of souls, a metempsychosis, deals solely with the passing of the soul after death into another mortal form lycanthropy confines itself to the metamorphosis of physical man to animal form only during man's physical lifetime metempsychosis is a change of condition dependent on the principle of evolution i e evolution upward and retrogressive lycanthropy is a change of condition relative to a property entirely independent of evolution the one is wholly determined by man's spiritual state at the time of his physical dissolution the other is simply a faculty of sense either handed down to man by his forefathers or acquired by man during his lifetime through the knowledge and practice of magic there are absolutely no grounds, other than purely hypothetical ones, for supposing a werewolf to be a reincarnation. But on the other hand, there is reason to believe that the wolf personality of the werewolf, at the latter's physical dissolution, remains earthbound in the form of a lupine phantasm so that although there is nothing to associate lycanthropy with metempsychosis there is at all events something in common between lycanthropy and animism animism be it understood holds that every living thing whether man beast reptile insect or vegetable has a representative spirit as an example of a lupine phantasm representing the personality of the werewolf, I will quote a case reported to me some years ago as having occurred in Estonia on the shores of the Baltic. A gentleman and his sister, whom I will call Stanislaus and Anno Dodimer, were invited to spend a few weeks with their old friends, the Baron and Baroness von A, at their country home in Estonia. On the day arranged, they set out for their friend's house, and, alighting at a little station within twenty miles of their destination, were met by the baron's droshky. It was one of those exquisite evenings, a night light without moon, a day shady without clouds, peculiar to that clime. Indeed, it seemed as if the last glow of the evening and the first gray of the morning had melted together and as if all the luminaries of the sky merely rested their beams without withdrawing them. To Stanislaus and Anno, jaded with the wear and tear of life in a big city, the calm and quiet of the countryside was most refreshing, and they heaved great sighs of contentment as they leaned far back amid the luxurious upholstery of the carriage, and drew in deep breaths of the smokeless, pure, scented air their surroundings modelled their thoughts instead of discussing monetary matters which had so long been uppermost in their minds they discoursed on the wonderful economy of happiness in a world full of toil and struggle the fewer the joys they argued the higher the enjoyment till the last and highest joy of all true peace of mind i e content was the one joy found to contain every other joy Occasionally they paused to remark on the brilliant luster of the stars, and not infrequently alluded to the Creator's graciousness in allowing them to behold such beauty. Occasionally, too, they would break off in the midst of their conversation to listen to the plaintive utterings of some night bird or the shrill cry of a startled hare. The rate at which they were progressing, for the horses were young and fresh, speedily brought them to an end of the open country, and they found themselves suddenly immersed in the deepening gloom of a dense and extensive forest of pines. The track now was not quite so smooth. 
Here and there were big ruts, and Stanislaus and his sister were subjected to such a vigorous bumping that they had to hold on to the sides of the droshky and to one another. In the altered conditions of their travel, conversation was well-nigh impossible. The little they attempted was unceremoniously jerked out of them, and the nature of it, I am loath to admit, had somewhat deteriorated. It had, in fact, in accordance with their surroundings, undergone a considerable change. "'What a vile road!' Stanislaw exclaimed, clutching the side of the droshky with both hands to save himself from being precipitated into space. "'Yes, isn't it?' gasped Anno, as she lunged forward, and, in a vain attempt to regain her seat, fell on their handbag, which gave an ominous squish. "'I declare there th th there will be t t nothing left of me b b b by, b by the time we get th there. Oh, dear, whatever shall I do? Wherever have you got to, Stanislaus?' The upper half of Stanislaus was nowhere to be seen. His lower half, however, was discovered by his sister convulsively pressed against the side of the droshky. In another moment this too would undoubtedly have disappeared, and the lower extremities would have gone in pursuit of the upper, had not Anno, with admirable presence of mind, effected a rescue. She tugged at her brother's coat-tails in the very nick of time, with the result that his whole body once again hove into view. Just then a bird sang its final song before retiring for the night, and Stanislaus, hot and trembling all over, shouted out, "'What a hideous noise! I declare it quite frightened me!' whilst Anno shuddered and put her fingers in her ears. They once more abused the road, then the trees. "'Great ugly things,' they said. "'They shut out all the light.' and then they abused the driver for not looking out where he was going, and finally they began to abuse one another. Anno abused Stanislaus because he had disarranged her hat and hair, and Stanislaus, Anno, because he couldn't hear all she said, and because what he did hear was silly. Then the Stygian darkness of the great pines grew, and the silence of wonder fell on the two quarrelers. On 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 rolled the droshky a monotonous rumble rumble that sounded very loud amid the intense hush that had suddenly fallen on the forest stanislaus and anno grew drowsy the cold night air crowning their exertions of the day induced sleep and they were soon very much in the land of nods Stanislaus, with his head thrust back as far as it would go, and Anno, with her head leaning slightly forward, and her chin deeply rooted in the silvery recesses of her rich fur coat. The driver stopped for a moment. He had to attend to his lights, which, he reflected, were behaving in rather an odd manner. Then, scratching his head thoughtfully, he cracked his whip and drove hurriedly on. Once again, rumble, 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 and no other sounds but far-away echoes and the gentle cooing of a soft night breeze through the forked and ragged branches of the sad and stately pines. On, 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 the light uncertain and the horses brisk. Suddenly the driver hears something. He strains his ears to catch the meaning of the sounds, a peculiar quick patter-patter, coming from far away in the droshky's wake. There is something, he can't exactly tell what, in those sounds he doesn't like. They are human, and yet not human. They may proceed from someone running, someone tall and lithe, with an unusually long stride. They may, and he casts a shuddering look over his shoulder as the thought strikes him, they may be nothing human, they may be the patter of a wolf, a huge, gaunt, hungry wolf, an abnormally big wolf, a wolf with a gallop like that of a horse. The driver was new to these parts. He had but lately come from the baron's establishment in St. Petersburg. 
He had never been in this wood after dark, and he had never seen a wolf, save in the zoological gardens. The atmosphere now began to sharpen. From being merely cold, it became positively icy, and muttering, I never felt anything like this in St. Petersburg, the driver shrank into the depths of his furs, and tried to settle himself more comfortably in his seat. The horses, too, four in number, were strangers in Estonia, the baron having only recently paid a heavy price for them in Nava on account of their beauty. Not that they were merely handsome. Despite their small and graceful build and the glossy sleekness of their coats, they were both strong and spirited, and could cover twenty-five versts without a pause. But now they too heard the sounds, there was no doubt of that, and felt the cold. At first they shivered, then whinnied, and then came to an abrupt halt, and then, without the slightest warning, tore the shifting tag and rag tight around them, and bounding forward were off like the wind. Then away in their rear, and plainly audible above the thunder of their hoofs, came a moaning, snarling, drawn-out cry, which was almost instantly repeated, not once, but again and again. Stanislaus and Anno, who had been rudely awakened from their slumbers by the unusual behavior of the horses, were now on the qui vive. "'Good heavens, what's that?' they cried in chorus. "'What's that, coachman?' shrieked Anno, digging the shivering driver in the back. "'Volki, mistress, Volki!' was the reply, and on flew the droshki faster, faster, faster. To Stanislaus and Anno the word wolves came as a stunning shock. All the tales they had ever heard of these ferocious beasts crowded their minds at once. Wolves! Was it possible that those dreadful bogies of their childhood, those grim and awful creatures, grotesquely but none the less vividly portrayed in their imagination by horror-loving nurses, were actually close at hand? Supposing the brutes caught them, who would be eaten first? Anno, Stanislaus, or the driver? Would they devour them with their clothes on? If not, how would they get them off? Then, filled with morbid curiosity, they strained their ears and listened. Again, this time nearer, much nearer, came that cry, dismal, protracted, nerve-wracking. Nor was that all, for they could now discern the pat-pat, pat-pat of footsteps, long, soft, loping footsteps, as of huge furry paws or naked human feet. However, they could see nothing nothing but blackness intensified by the feeble flickering of the droshki's lanterns faster drive faster anno shouted turning round and poking the coachman in the ribs with her umbrella do you want us all to be eaten i can't mistress i can't the man expostulated the horses are outstripping the wind as it is they can't go quicker and the driver, consigning Stanislaus and his sister to the innermost recesses of hell, prayed to the Virgin to save him. Nearer and nearer drew the steps, and again a cry, a cry close behind them, perhaps fifty yards, fifty yards at the most. And as they were trying to locate it, there burst into view a gigantic figure, nude and luminous, a figure that glowed like a glow-worm and bent slightly forward as it ran. It covered the ground with long, easy, swinging strides without any apparent effort. In general form, its body was like that of a man, saving that the limbs were longer and covered with short hair, and the feet and hands, besides being larger as a whole, had longer toes and fingers. Its head was partly human, partly lupine. The skull, ears, teeth, and eyes were those of a wolf, whilst the remaining features were those of a man. Its complexion was devoid of color, startlingly white. Its eyes green and lurid, its expression hellish. Stanislaus and Anno did not know what to make of it. Was it some terrible monstrosity that had escaped from a show, or something that was peculiar to the forest itself, something generated by the giant trees and dark, silent road? 
In their sublime terror they shrieked aloud, beat the air with their hands to ward it off, and finally left their seats to cling to the back of the driver's box. But it came nearer, nearer, and nearer, until they were almost within reach of its arms. They read death in the glinting greenness of its eyes and in the flashing of its long bared teeth. The climax of their agony, they argued, could no longer be postponed. The thing had only to make a grab at them, and they would die of horror, die even before it touched them. But this was not to be. They were still staring into the pale, malevolent face drawing nearer and nearer, and wondering when the long, twitching fingers would catch them by the throats, when the droshky, with a mad whirl forward, cleared the f gazing wildly into empty, moonlit space, with no sign of their pursuer anywhere. An hour later they narrated their adventure to the Baron. Nothing could have exceeded his distress. "'My dear friends,' he said, "'I owe you a profound apology. "'I ought to have told my man to choose any other road "'rather than that through the forest, "'which is well known to be haunted. "'According to rumor, a werewolf, "'we have good reason to believe in werewolves here, "'was killed there many years ago.'" This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 